come to Captivated from Transcend.
Reza, we can't hear Kim. Is that the way it's supposed to be? Um, you are supposed to hear her. Yes, uh, we have uh, the sound here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, but I can't hear Kim. Okay, oh. Kim looks like they're not hearing you on the ground for some reason. Can you say a few oh, words, no. Kim? I have original sound on. Can you hear me from where you where you are? I don't see. Let me try. Yes, can I can hear, hear you all fine. You. Yeah, we can hear you talking, but we can't hear the harp. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. Maybe I could do a quick little glitch. Is somebody there on the ground that could hear me? Let's see. That was very good. We could hear you all fine online. Um, I don't know what's the issue with the people on can't, the ground. Can't hear the heart. Can you guys at all. hear me okay? Hmm. Okay. So uh, we have still three minutes uh, for you, Kim, if you can. Uh... More minutes. Okay. That, so that was Captivated and Reasons for Leaving Beyond Cloud Nine and Transcend. And now we come to Equestrian Trails. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Kim. We really oh, do appreciate welcome. that. <laughs> uh, a great way to start the meeting, as always. Thank um, you. Happy Valentine's, everyone, or happy belated Valentine's. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's worth working a few extra days on a Valentine. Um, <laughs> anyway, welcome, everybody, to the February a meeting of Orange County Astronomers. Um, you may have noticed that we are a week later than usual. I hope everybody remembered that. And um, if you didn't, you can, I hope, catch it on the replay. Um, if you have any questions about that, check with our estimable vice president, who knows all about those things. Um, anyway, we ha do have a great lineup tonight. Um, we hope that uh, you will enjoy it thoroughly. And without taking any more of your time, let me turn this over to Kyle Graham, who will be giving us the club announcements. Great. Thank you. Let me just get this up and running. All right. So first off, uh, just announcing the new uh, board directors for the 2024 year. Uh, you can see all of the people there. Again, our president, Barbara Toy. Vice President Reza, Secretary Allen, and Treasurer Charlie. Um, shouldn't be any changes, but here you go. Uh, welcome new members. Uh, you'll be able to pick up your name badges either on the whiteboard uh, in person either this month or next month. And if you're not, those meetings, then it'll just be mailed to you. Star parties. The next ANZA star party will be March 9th. Astrophysics will be meeting at the Heritage Museum on February 23rd. Beginners class March 1st and the board meeting March 3rd. Those are online. Please check the website for more information on that. Uh, outreach events program is currently on hold, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the email there, outreach at ocastronomers.org. The adopt -a scope program you can find information on our website. Uh, you can see here how to find the information to get the uh, current adoption agreement and download a list of our current inventory. There's a bunch of information there about the program and uh, you can get more information on that there. The Serious Astronomer Newsletter, uh, Dave Fisher is the editor. If you would uh, have any items of interest that you feel would be interesting for everyone to see in the club, feel free to contact Dave Fisher at the email there, and he will review those items of interest. Some things uh, that we look for, uh, articles, images, observations, trip reports, club news, ads for equipment for sale, etc. Uh, just want to remind everyone that everyone has mailed a hard copy of the Serious Astronomer Newsletter by default. But if you would like to stop receiving a mailed copy, please message Charlie and uh, he'll take care of that for you. And remember, everyone gets access to the newsletter online in electronic format. Again, everyone receives a printed copy unless you opt out and just want to view it online. Reminders uh, to keep your weeds clear at ANZA for those of you that have a pad uh, and please help keep the observatory areas clear as well as uh, keeping the areas around the ANZA house and football field clear. Uh, the total eclipse is coming up on April 8th. You can see the path there um, and you can see more information on that link or pretty much any quick Google search will provide you the information on the eclipse from NASA or any other reputable source. Um, but just a reminder that that's coming up soon. All right. So the next general meeting will be March 8th. And I will turn it over to Alex McConaughey, uh, who will be doing our WhatsApp presentation. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? And can you see my screen? Hi, Alex. Yes, uh, your screen is all good and we can hear you clearly. Okay. I have one more thing to do. And thanks for having me back, Reza. Uh, I was inspired by Chris Butler's show last month where he showed us all the featured objects that were coming this winter. My approach is going to be a little different than his. I'll tell you a little bit about the solar system's ha happenings, but mostly I want to go to deep space. And we're going to focus in depth on one constellation and why it makes, uh, wh why it's so colorful. That's going to be Orion. Uh, locally, except for Jupiter and early risers for Venus, there's not a whole lot to see planet wise this month. Here are the things that we can see. But as you can see, there's, there's not much. Like the snow moon will reach its peak brightness near Regulus on February 24th. And it'll be a kind of small micro moon because it's about as far away from the Earth on its elliptical orbit as it can be. And we get to see a pan stars comet showing up pretty soon here, and, and we should be able to see it now. Uh, it reached its closest point to the sun or perihelion on Valentine's Day. And note that we are in min midwinter now, and pan stars will be hanging around mostly in the summer constellations. So that means you're going to have to get up early in the morning to see it. The comet will reach its closest, but not dangerous, don't worry about it, approach to Earth <laughs> on uh, March 14th. Click. Not technically syzygies, perhaps, but we do have a few close encounters between uh, the between different objects up there uh, between now and the next meeting for those who like to capture such pairings. But as I said, I want to go to deep space beyond our solar system. Last month, Chris drew a distinction between the rather thick summer Milky Way, which is filled with so many things to see because the Earth is looking in we're here, we're looking in towards the center of the thicky, thickly populated Milky Way at night. Now in winter, on the other hand, like in this picture, we're looking outwards and it's really not all that far between where we are and the edge of the galaxy and we're looking off into empty intergalactic space, or extragalactic space. Um, there is simply less to see out there. Now, Chris surveyed the whole winter Milky Way we're going to focus on the mighty hunter, Orion. With your naked eye on a clear night, you can see easily the mighty hunter. Blow this area up, this area right in through here, and you might be able to see this with your naked eye. There are many legends about this hunter, but we'll save them for another time. Turn that picture around a little bit and... Um, Add some filtering and you might see something like this. If you add a lot of filtering and use a camera, which can take hours worth of exposure instead of your eyes, which can gather light for only about a 30th of a second, you might get something like this. Assign colors and you get the stunning image presented by Rogelio Bernal Andreu. We're going to explore Orion and see where these colors come from. This wonderful melange of colors comes from four types of light. Star colors, reflections of those star colors, gas that is excited to such a point that it glows like a neon lamp, and finally, clouds of dark, relatively cool gases that block the light behind them. And before we go any further, let's make something clear. If you were out there, you would not any really see any color or gas clouds or anything as spectacular as this heavily manipulated photograph shows. You would only see some bright whitish stars. Why? Well, one reason is the nature of how we see. Our eyes can only see color when the color is bright enough. To see color, there must be enough light to excite the cones in your eyes. In dim light, only our rods work, and they cannot see color. Secondly, our eyes see an image for only about a 30th of a second. A camera, however, can run an exposure for several minutes at a time, gathering light. And the imager can combine many images together to make both the lights and the colors show. 
Secondly, we're looking at these gases and dust clouds from far away. On a smoggy day, look across the road. You're not going to see smog. You're too close to the other side of the road, and there's not enough smog between you and the other side to block your view. Now look up towards Mount Baldy or some other distant mountain. You can see that there's a smog because there's a lot more smoke, and dust, and fog between you and the mountains. Same thing happens when we're looking at celestial objects from far away. If we were in the middle of these things, the gases and dusts would not be visible, and certainly they would not appear in color. With cameras and such, from where we are, we can see, however, four different types of light in Orion. The first type of light is based on something we remember from high school science class. Materials glow in a color that depends on how hot they are. We all think of red hot down here as being pretty hot. But in fact, as something heats up and starts to glow, red is just the first step. The hotter something gets, the more it tends from red to orange to yellow, bluish white, white, and then finally up to blue, hot. That's what makes star colors. Betelgeuse is our first stop. It's right up in here. Uh, and we got to talk about it because it's about to blow up and destroy our planet and pretty much every living thing that we love and hold so dear. Or maybe not. Who knows? And who knows when? It's right up here in the armpit of the giant. It's also called the hand of the giant for those whose interests reflect more than my middle school maturity. It's really big, about 640 times the size of our sun. If it were where the sun is, it would extend out past our asteroid belt. It is so big that it was the first star besides our sun to be measured directly in arc seconds. It's more than four or five hundredths of an arc second across. Most other stars are so small they are just pinpoints in our equipment. Lately, it has gone through some irregular cycles in uh, brightening and dimming. This is probably caused by a huge area of relatively cool temperatures on the surface. The cooler temperature limits the light output. Oh, and yes, it is predicted that Betelgeuse is near the end of its life, which will happen in a giant supernova sometime in the next 100,000 to a million years. And no, it won't destroy the Earth, since whatever happens up there will happen four or five, six hundred, maybe 600 light years away. They're not sure how far it is away. But it will probably be busy, visible during the day for a while. We call it reddish-orange because it glows at about 3,000 degrees, right here in between red and orange. Rigel is off to the lower right in this arrangement. I think I've got it there. Yeah. Uh, its name comes from knee or foot. What is especially cool about it is that it's not just one star, but a star system comprised of four stars. There's Rigel itself and B and C. And then B has another little buddy circling it. This GIF animation here um, uh, gives you some idea of what's happening in another different, uh, this is Algo, a different multiple star system that shows what it might look like. Rigel B and C orbit each other in about 10 days, but it takes them 24,000 years to get all the way around Rigel itself. You can split Rigel with a rather modest visual equipment. Herschel did it back in 1790. Use a high-power eyepiece pointed at to easy to find Rigel and concentrate, avoiding the high brightness of Rigel itself by putting it just out of the field of view. As you can see, Rigel at 12,000 some degrees is right in through here between, whoops, between, I clicked the button wrong, between the, the blue and the white. Our second source of color is demonstrated uh, by Rigel. Here, see here, and here, this is all the same object, all right? You can see a reflection nebula. Is it a gray cloud? Rigel and other stars give off so much light, and the light bounces off nearby dust clouds. It is not heating up that dust all that much, certainly not enough for the cloud to start emitting its own light like we see in the next with emission nebulas, but still enough to make the dust visible. This is the witch edge. IC 2118. 
It's actually in the next door constellation, Eridanus. It's extremely faint and a photographic, not a visual object. Emission nebula, the third kind of light that, that lights up Orion, um, are come from stars that are that are hotter than probably twenty five thousand Kelvin. They generally emit enough ionizing ultraviolet radiation to cause all the gas around them to brighten up beyond simple reflection of starlight. The heat makes the electrons move and perhaps even depart the nucleus, leaving us with glowing ions. These make for emission nebulas. This is not dependent on temperature alone, but the composition of the atoms. Atoms have a nucleus, and around that nucleus swirl electrons. The electrons orbit the nucleus at various levels. When an electron moves from one level to another, it emits or absorbs a bit of energy. That energy could emerge as a photon of light, but the color of the photon depends on how far the electron moves from one energy level to another. The number of electrons and the levels depends on the composition of the nucleus and the electron shell and the amount of energy provided by the surrounding stars. In other words, different nuclei, which means different elements, give off different colors. Here you can see that hydrogen glows in red and in a different form in kind of an aqua color and even down into blue and indigo. Um, hydrogen alpha is the most visible at 656.2 nanometers and in a lab it really is kind of a pinkish red in the lab, but you know, um, astro is kind of hot on deep red, and that's what they call that pinkish glow of hydrogen alpha. When hydrogen drops to different levels, it gives off different uh, colors. So you can tell what element is up there by what color it's giving off. Perhaps the most photographed emission nebula of all is M42, the Orion Nebula. Depending on the equipment and the imagination of the imager, it could be represented in many different ways. But the key thing is that it's a very large region of fairly dense gas that it is heated by so very many hot stars that the stars ionize and glow in colors peculiar to that gas. With naked eyes, even in moderate light pollution, a faint glow can be found right down here. It's hanging like the sword from the three stars of the belt. It's not quite as obvious as this image may show, but as this image may show here, but it's easy to find using the asterism of Orion's belt, the three stars, Al Nitaka, Al Nilam, and Mintaka. Um, it should be noted that M42 is right next to M43, and the two are often imaged together. This is 42. Let's see. This is 42, and that's 43 over there. They are separated by a region of dim, non-reflecting, non-glowing gas and dust. What is causing all this ionization and all that glowing? Well, among other things, if you look down in through here, um, this bright spot in M42, it's a collection of new stars that are being created as we speak. One challenge for visual astronomers is to try to count how many stars he or she can see in the heart of the trapezium star cluster. Can you visually split these four on a dark night out at Anza? You should be able to. The final type of nebula depends not on light, but on the absence of light. These are dark areas caused by inert dust blocking the light behind. Um, the dust is so cool, it will not glow. It's far enough away from any bright star that it does not reflect or get heated. There is so much of it that we cannot see through it. These are the dark nebulae. For an example of that in Orion, we turn to another of the, one of the most photographed objects in the sky, the Horsehead Nebula. In itself, we would probably not be able to see it in the visual band of red and green and blue. Can you find it in our master picture? on the left over here. Can you see the horse head? Okay, well, let's go looking for it. Maybe we need to blow it up a little bit. Can you see it now? If I make it bigger, can you see it yet? 
it's there. I can see it. I know where it is. Uh, there it is. It's just a little baby tiny thing. And it's a very difficult visual object because this red is not nearly as bright red as you might think. It's That's photography for you. It's not what you would see in the telescope with your eyeballs. A good, a good imager can get something like this, right? You would not, you would see no recognizable shape here were it not a silhouette with this bright red cloud of glowing gas behind it. It's this glowing gas that makes it visible at all. <coughs> That's an emission nebula, but because there's a dark nebula in front of it, you can see the dark nebula. What you see is the horse's head in the absence of that glow caused by dust. It's the dust is blocking the light from the emission nebula behind it. If you had a camera that could see in a different wavelength, like infrared, which can see the dust and gas, but not the glowing gas behind, you would see something like this. Given the tyranny of time that allows only 15 minutes for a what's up here at OCA, we're going to have to skip many of the other fascinating things that there are to hunt down in the Great Hunter. But I want to sum up all that we have looked for so far by checking on, well, Orion's ugly sister, M78. It's a little bit up in the corner around from everything else. Whether This is the cool part down here. And then you got to come up around this way to find M78. Of all the objects in the constellation, it is, I think, the most ignored. I've never taken a good picture of it. I think because... For me, there's no there, there. There's nothing like a horsey's head or the big peacock of M42 or the bright glow of a star colors. Nothing like the veil of a witch, no trapezium to count the stars. It's just a lot of stuff happening in the field of view. It's got your dark nebulas. It's got your emission nebulas. It's got your reflection nebulas. It's got all your star colors. It's got everything you could have. Uh, but it just never got around to getting organized enough to get a cool name. It's definitely worth a visit, just as all of Orion is worth a visit. So good night from Zoomland, and hope to see you again someday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, for a great presentation. Indeed, Orion is the star of winter nights and worthy of a, a whole presentation on itself you know thank you very much for doing the astrophysics of it taking us through the journey of reflection nebulae emission nebulae and dark nebulae so many things to see so uh next up in our program we have our main speaker and without any further ado let me go ahead into introducing her our speaker tonight is an associate professor of physics at University of Connecticut, where she leads the Milky Way Laboratory. Her research uses our Milky Way as a laboratory to explore physics across the cosmos using both large observational surveys and numerical simulations. She has authored over 70 publications and given over 50 invited research presentation and also worked with folks at NASA to develop uh, space mission concepts. Please join me in welcoming Kara Battersby. Kara. Hi, thank you so much for the warm welcome. Um, just to confirm, you're seeing my main screen now, is that right? Great. Yes, all good. Okay. It is really an honor and a privilege to be here with you all tonight. Thank you so much for inviting me. To, your, to this meeting to share some of um, the research that I'm working on in my group. Um, so I always like to start with a little bit of introduction um, about me and my story. So we'll start at the very beginning. This is me as a little kid, and I particularly like this little drawing that I made. I still can't figure out what I thought was happening there. As far as I can tell, I think that's I saw probably in a science classroom an emergency shower and I was like, oh, you do the emergency shower when you're a scientist and really had no context. I had, um, I didn't know any scientists when I was growing up, uh, but I knew that I thought science was really cool in school. Um, after that, I got to do my first research experience at the MIT Haystack Observatory, which is this really beautiful telescope hidden behind this dome here. 
um, did my undergraduate at UMass Amherst and then um, have been involved in astronomy ever since. It's sort of one of my earliest passions and the one that kind of just grabbed hold of me and just never let go. Um, you know, and the my role in the career has changed over time. Uh, when I was a grad student and postdoc, I went to a lot, a lot of observatories. You can see a couple of them here from the mountains of Hawaii, Mauna Kea, to the desert of New Mexico and across the ocean in um, the Urim telescope in Spain, in the mountains of Spain. Nowadays, as a professor and a mom of two young kids, I spend much more time close to home. And I've spent a lot of my time in the last few years developing a new astronomy program at the University of Connecticut. Um, so when I was hired, there was no astronomy program. There was one single astronomy class. And so over the last five years, we've really developed a whole blossoming program with a astrophysics minor. We have about 20 graduate students, three postdocs. Uh, we even had Jocelyn Bell Burnell come visit us. Uh, which was really an honor that I think cemented our standing in my mind as a proper astronomy program. Um, so I spent a lot of my time doing that. I also work on a couple of really exciting outreach program, the UConn STARS program. Uh, we also do an Astron TAP program at UConn. So kind of like public talks, but with beer, which is kind of fun. Um, this is my research group, very near and dear to my heart. Um, this is not everyone, but this is a large uh, bunch of us, including you can see in one picture, my young daughter. And then in the other one, I somehow am managing to hold both kids, my three-year-old and my one-year-old. Um, my research group is awesome. They are I did a dynamic, just brilliant group of people you know, from undergraduate to graduate to postdoc levels, and we collaborate with international teams of scientists. Um, so before I dive into the science, I just wanted to share a little bit of the human aspect of the research that we do. Um, and I'll be talking about research from a bunch of the different people that you see pictured here. Um, so my thanks and credit to them as we get started. Okay. So the topic of the presentation tonight is on the wild west of star formation. Um, so I think of this as I've been studying star formation for a long time. Again, it's one of those things that really captured my attention early in my um, astronomy career. Uh, that first poster that you saw at my first astronomy conference just a few slides ago um, was a poster about star formation. And it's something I've been working on for a long time. And so I'll start by telling you about why star formation is so important and so interesting. And then what I've been excited about for about the last five, 10 years is really what I call the wild west of star formation, which is the very center of our galaxy where all of the rules of star formation that I thought we knew, I thought we had established them really well it turns out that they are actually quite different and um, they don't seem to be obeying all the same rules. And so we think of our galactic center as being this outlaw. And so um, I'll start by setting the stage about star formation in general, and then talk about this wild west of star formation where this darn galactic center is just breaking all our rules. So we'll start with just looking at a star. This star is my favorite star. This star is our sun. This is a picture of our sun. Uh, you can see the date on the bottom. It's from earlier. Well, it says 217. So it must be, yeah, universal time. It's from very recent, basically from now. I don't know what, I don't remember what the universal time changes, but um, it's, it's our sun now, basically. And this is a picture that's taken in an iron line. So it's really highlighting the uh, dynamic, energetic, magnetic field structures of our, of our sun. And um, you can actually look at a live 48 hour video of the last 48 hours of our sun and see the sunspots rotating as the sun moves, see these solar prominences 
rise and fall and flicker and occasionally explode with these flares. Um, and I could probably look at this every day. This is just, if you just Google Solar Dynamics Observatory, um, you can see the picture, a picture of the sun every single day and a video of the last 48 hours. So our sun is a star. And as I said, it's my personal favorite star because it's the source of all life and energy on earth. Um, it's, it's just, it's something you can palpably feel when you go outside. It, it's what makes our days, it's what makes our nights. Um, it is really just fundamentally important to us as humans. And so as a scientist who's always been curious, wonder how does this star form? Where does this come from? Are all stars like our stars um, or are they different? And when you look at the night sky, you see that there are many, many, many stars. If you're lucky and you go to a dark sky location, you might see the band of the Milky Way, this sort of dusty lane that's the, this milky strip going across the center of this image here. And you might see maybe right with the naked eye, something like a, a thousand or a few thousand stars in the night sky. Um, but our galaxy alone actually contains about a hundred billion stars, which is often compared to the number of grains of sand on every beach over the entire earth. Just one of these almost unthinkable, uncountable numbers. And how many of them are like ours? How many are different? And where did they all come from? Our closest spiral galaxy, Andromeda, also has about 100 billion stars in it. Um, and this is just one of many of these galaxies that surround us. So these are some nearby ones, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy, a beautiful grand design spiral example. Um, and M101, the Pinwheel Galaxy. This is one that I think is particularly fun and maybe is a good analog for what our own Milky Way looks like in terms of its spiral structure, where you don't have super clear, well-defined spiral arms. You have maybe four spiral arms with a lot of fluff in between. And after studying our Milky Way for a long time, I think our galaxy looks more like that. But again, each one of these, an object, a celestial object in space made largely of stars and not just one star, two star, hundreds of billions of stars. And of course it gets even bigger. This is a picture from the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, which is probably one of the most profoundly important and awe-inspiring images that I personally have ever seen. So for those of you that don't know, the Hubble Extreme Deep Field was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is one of the most powerful telescopes ever built by humans and launched into space. And Hubble has a lot of key science goals. When you work on these space missions, you have specific goal number one, goal number two, goal number two, A, B, C, D, these measurements, those measurements, that survey, blah, 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 blah. You plan everything out with ridiculous precision um, and everything is largely determined. And somebody decided with the Hubble telescope, they said, what if we just looked at nothing? Hubble spends a lot of time looking at galaxies, quasars, stars, nebula. What if we just looked at nothing? And this is what I mean by nothing. So this is um, the extreme deep field, this small little rectangle with the XDF next to it in the center of the image. And right next to that is the size of the full moon to scale. So you can see that it really is just a tiny, tiny, tiny little fraction of the sky. And so Hubble spent not just minutes, not just hours, but days staring at this patch of sky where there was no known stars, no known galaxies, or, or very few nearby galaxies, very few stars, and was just, as far as we could tell, nothing, okay? 
And this is what it found, which is the opposite of nothing. This is everything. This is just teeming at the brim with galaxies, nearby galaxies, far away galaxies. If you're a poor graduate student and you sit down at your computer and look at this in excruciating detail, you would actually count that this image contains about 15,000 galaxies. And if you look back at the size on the sky that that corresponds to, maybe think about something like your pinky nail held at arm's length. Look at that. And then that little pinky nail has about 15,000 galaxies in it. And then just imagine the rest of the sky just painted with that density of galaxies. And for me, that is something that really hits home how vast and wide our universe is and how we are just such a small, tiny piece of it, which in some ways is humbling and in other ways is really incredible that we are part of this vast, rich cosmos that has so much to be explored, so many questions. Today we're focusing on the question of, you know, all these galaxies are made up of stars. Where do these stars come from? And the last point I'm gonna make about this is that when we are looking at these stars, it's really not just even just the cosmic mystery, which as someone who's always been fascinated by the stars, um, that's enough for me. But it's not, it's not even just that, it's, it's where we come from as human beings. And now I don't mean the stork. I mean like our whole cosmic history, our whole cosmic origin. This picture shows sort of our theoretical idea of the history of the universe from the big bang that started the universe on the left side up through the development of galaxies and stars and planets up to the present day at the right side of the picture. And you really can't have humans without having done all that work to create the universe because at the beginning, not only was the universe just this hot soup of protons and neutrons and electrons and dark energy and dark matter, um, that was way too hot. And anyways, humans couldn't live there. You, you literally didn't have the building blocks for humans or laptops or pie or anything that, that we know and love here on earth. And that's because when you look at the things that make up a human shown in this nice little periodic table as like green things, green elements are the ones that are most common in humans, with the blue ones being trace elements in humans. Um, only the top two elements on this diagram, hydrogen and helium, with maybe just a little, little tiny bit of lithium, were the only things that were present in the universe when it was formed. Everything else on here came through the formation of stars the nuclear fusion that happens in, in the interiors of stars. And then those stars explode at the end of their lives and spew that material back into the cosmos, which then goes and forms new generations of stars and new generations of planets. And then those planets are enriched with carbon, nitrogen and oxygen and the things that you need to make a human and laptops and apple pie and all of those things. Um, you can also get some of these from merging neutron stars. It's actually really fun to learn about where all of the elements come from, but it really, it's mostly just driven by stars. They all come from the inside of stars. So Carl Sagan famously said that we are made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. And so when we look back at our cosmic history and the past, we're really studying where we came from. The very elements that make up your body came from the inside of stars. And so this, this quest for understanding our cosmic origins and how these stars form and where they came from 
um, it really comes back to our own origins as human beings. And so when I ask the question of how stars form, I want to know how they form. What is the process by which they form? What is the physics involved? I want to know where they form and where they don't form. Do they only form in galaxies? Do they form in the centers of galaxies, at the edges of galaxies all over? How often do they form? Do you have... Um, one interesting thing that we found is that it seems like we've actually passed the peak of cosmic star formation and that most of the star formation that's ever going to happen in the universe was already happening about 10 billion years ago. And we're just sort of tapering off at the end of it, which is a little sad, a little existentially draining, but um, seems to be true. And then of course, what are the important mechanisms and environment for storms to form? So putting this in the context of today's talk with the wild west of star formation, I wanna first introduce what are the rules for star formation and then learn about how the galactic center is breaking those rules. So I was gonna start with this short video of um, Orion, if I can get this to start, here we go. Um, we actually had this really nice introduction already in the what's up, looking closer, zooming in on the constellation of Orion to the nebula of Orion, where we're gonna zoom in on that central nebular region with the trapezium cluster. I think that's pretty good. So this takes us now to this um, Hubble Space Telescope picture of Orion. And um, again, it was really fantastic what's up introduction at the beginning here, because now you can not only appreciate these beautiful colors and just sort of how exquisitely artistic this picture is, but you can know that at the center here, there's this cluster of hot blue white stars, this trapezium cluster surrounded by ionized gas. These dark dust lanes that I've marked here as cold dust, that's actually places where there's um, the dust and gas is so cold and so dense, it's actually just blocking that light behind it. And this is gonna be a pattern that we're gonna see throughout this talk is that as we go to denser and denser regions of star formation, you have to go to longer and longer wavelengths to see deep inside of the dust and see the inside of these regions that are forming stars and planets. In the Orion Nebula, you can actually zoom in and see these little things that we call proplids, which are now known to be just these small little protoplanetary disks, regions where not only do you have young stars forming, but you have the planets forming around them. And so the basic process of how stars and planets form uh, is pictured here. And of course it's, I mean, this is very simple. The simplest version of what this is. A cloud of gas and dust comes together through you know, the chaotic motions within a galaxy. And once it gets a little bit denser and a little bit closer, the force of gravity starts to take over and pull everything closer and closer and closer together. As this happens, there's a net angular momentum where the cloud has some net spin. And as it starts to collapse down, um, things that are not on that axis of net angular momentum, they fall in really easily. And the things that are on that disk of the angular momentum, they sort of, they can't fall in because they need to conserve that angular momentum. And so they flatten into this nice disk. Um, at the very center of this region, now looking at the, the bottom figure here, that's where the new star forms, where the density just gets higher and higher and higher and higher till suddenly you can overcome this incredible repulsive force between the uh, nuclei of atoms as positive, positive charge repulsion where these things just, they don't wanna touch each other because they repel each other through electromagnetic force. But if you get the, 
gas to be dense enough and hot enough they can overcome this. And then the strong force takes over and you get nuclear fusion. You get these um, nuclei to actually stick together. And that's what powers a star. That's what makes a star. And so you have this high density star at the very center. And around that is this disk of material, um, which I feel like from an astronomical context would be just really insignificant because the disk of material doesn't have a large mass. It's not a major component to, you know, feeding back to the rest of the galaxy. But then it just turns out that there's this tiny little detail that that's where planets and humans and probably all life that may exist in the universe comes from is those little, those little insignificant planets. Turns out that they're actually really important. So once that star, the planets form in that disk around the star, uh, they coalesce from small little dust grains into bigger dust grains, into pebbles, into bigger pebbles, bigger rocks. And then all the gas can sort of go along with that as well and make this atmosphere. And then once the star ignites its nuclear fusion, it has this um, hot ionizing radiation, these winds that blow out all of that gas and dust that isn't in some kind of solid object like a planet or an asteroid or a comet, blows that all away. And so this is our simple picture of star and planet formation. But of course, as a physicist, I need to make it even simpler because this has got colors and structure. So let's think about it from like the most simple physics perspective, which is just forces. So we just have two forces going inwards. You have the force of gravity, everything in the universe that has mass, which is everything, is attracted to every other thing that has mass. And it's always going to be a force that's just pulling things together. And then on the other side of the equation, you have this internal gas pressure. This is the part of the gas that doesn't want to collapse under the force of gravity. This can be just the temperature of the gas, just the fact that these particles are moving around, they're doing a little wild dance, um, and they don't want to be collapsed under the force of gravity. It can be turbulence or magnetic fields. Um, and so I used to think of it as like this competition between the gas pressure and gravity. And if gravity wins, then you get to form a star. But if the gas pressure wins, which happens sometimes too, then this little over density that you had dissipates and just becomes part of the interstellar medium between the stars. Um, so you really need gravity to win. But I decided that this like competition was not really accurate. And so I like this picture of the My Little Ponies instead, where gravity is this pink My Little Pony. It's that friend of yours who just loves hugs, just always wants to give everyone a big hug. And the gas pressure is like the antisocial person is just like, no, I don't want it. I don't want it. No, 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 no. And if gravity wins and takes over, gets that big old hug, then that's when you get to form a star. And I like this one better because it really just encapsulates the fact that gravity just wants to pull everything together and the gas pressure is just trying to pull everything apart. Okay, so lest I leave you with the impression that stars form from My Little Ponies, let me give you a slightly more accurate scientific picture of how these stars are formed. This is a numerical simulation of a molecular cloud that is collapsing slowly under the force of gravity. You can see this time axis here. Okay, this happens over the course of millions of years, which is why I don't have an observational picture. I only have the simulations because we don't have an observational picture. We haven't been taking data for tens of thousands or millions of years. So this gas slowly collapses under the force of gravity. And you can see that where it forms, you get denser and denser and denser gas. And this comes together to form stars and planets. And then eventually those stars feed back on their environment. And then the next step would really just destroy this entire cloud from that. Okay. So coming back to our Orion Nebula, this is again, a visible light picture of Orion. I'm gonna, zoom out a little bit now 
I now look at kind of a near infrared picture from ESO's Paranal Observatory in Chile. And then now looking at one kind of registered to the same size scale of the Spitzer Space Telescope image of Orion, where suddenly now you can look at these dark, dusty regions in this original optical image. And you can see that that's actually the location of all this dense gas and star formation. And you can start to pick out um, not just individual stars, but these little tiny over densities of gas that are where gravity is just starting to take over from the gas pressure and form these new stars and these new planets. And so um, this kind of, I don't think you can see my cursor, but that's kind of like dense little river of like dark cloud in the very center with kind of these green dots. That's the location of these new stars that are being formed. And the reason that the stars always form in this cold, dense gas is because you need to have locations where gravity can take over. And gravity likes it when the density is high. It means that things are closer together. It's easy for gravity to take over. And gravity also likes places where the gas pressure is low. Because if the gas pressure is really high, let's say you have a really energetic toddler who's just running all over the house and you need to grab them and put their shoes on, it's going to be really hard if they're extremely high energy. But if they're calmer, quiet, like cool gas that's moving slowly and doesn't have a lot of internal energy, it's easy to grab that toddler, put their shoes on, and form a star. So we take images like this, and we start to do quantitative measures to ask the question, is there a role for star formation? Are there equations we can write down that dictate the behavior of how and when stars form? So you might think you could look at something like a relationship between the mass of a cloud, how much stuff there is, and then the number of young stars that then form. And of course, you would think the relationship goes something like this. If you have more stuff, you're going to form more stars. Perfect. Let's add some data. There you go. Hmm. Not such a good relationship there. This is a scatter plot if I've ever seen one. These are all over the place. I don't see any well-behaved law that I can derive from this. But if you make this one critical change, where instead of just looking at the mass of the cloud, of the overall cloud, you look at the mass of all the dense stuff. Because we already talked about that the dense stuff is where the stars actually form. All that other stuff, it's too high energy. It has too much stuff going on and it can't collapse down under the force of gravity. So now if we look at not just the mass of the cloud, but the mass of the cloud above some critical density, you suddenly see this beautiful trend with the number of young stars. And so we know there is indeed a role for star formation, and it is that the amount of star formation that you have depends directly on the amount of dense gas that you have which is pretty powerful because we can't count stars everywhere in the universe. We certainly can't count young new forming stars everywhere in the universe, but we can oftentimes count the amount of gas that there is. And so if I can say, hey, I see this cloud about, you know, a billion light years away, here's how much stuff there is, I can tell you how many stars that cloud should form if you have this law and rule for star formation. So this is great. <clears throat> this is our a rendition of our Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is um, tens of thousands of light years across, which means we don't have a picture of the Milky Way galaxy because if you sent a satellite up to take a picture of it, you'd have to wait probably 50,000 years at minimum before you get a picture back. So got my fingers crossed for that one. But for right now we have a cartoon. 
the kind of star formation that I've just described to you, the clouds that were all on that plot that I showed to you are all within this kind of tiny little circle at the UR here. They're just in the solar neighborhood right around our star, the sun, which is in this large spiral galaxy about halfway out from the center of the galaxy to the outer edge of the galaxy. And it turns out that this part of the galaxy is filled with, it's extremely well behaved, like these lovely ladies from Downton Abbey enjoying a cup of tea. It follows this rule for star formation and um, we can understand it extremely well. And we think that most of the rest of the disk of our galaxy is like that as well, except for this one region at the very center of our galaxy, which seems more like Grand Theft Auto on Wild West shootout mode, which I personally have never played, but I'm guessing it's pretty wild. And that's what our galactic center is like. And I'll tell you more about why, but the basic idea is that um, the densities are different, the pressures are different, the turbulence is different. This is a part of our galaxy where you have gas flows crashing in, there's a super massive black hole you have feedback from stars, possibly feedback from the supermassive black hole, all of these things interacting with each other. And it doesn't seem like star formation follows the same rule. Um, so as any good scientist, it would be really tempting to just be like, la, 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 la. It doesn't exist. Let's pretend star formation is well behaved everywhere. Um, but it's not just the center of the galaxy. This is actually a really widespread thing because when we look at this picture of the Hubble Extreme Deep Field, a bunch of the galaxies that we're seeing here are actually in the very distant universe. And because of course, light takes time to travel to us from that distant universe, it means we're looking at the very early universe. And those very early universe galaxies are actually really, really similar in their turbulence, their pressures, their densities, their temperatures, all of these things that our galactic center has, these early galaxies seem to have as well. So we can't just ignore this galactic center. We need to understand it and hopefully try to apply it to the rest of this wide universe. So we have a basic rule for star formation and now we're trying to understand how this changes in different environments. So as like a little visual for this, here's our picture of the universe expansion and growth over time. And here is the center of our galaxy in this little zoom in picture here at the center of it, which we think is giving us a window into the early universe. So I'll quickly zoom through um, looking at the central region. So we start in visible light in the deep within the disk of our galaxy, we're looking straight through the disk down to the center of the galaxy. In visible light, we see a lot of stars and dust. As we, now I'm gonna zoom in on this yellow rectangle that's in the center. As we zoom into the infrared, we start to see warm dust and bubbles that are showing us where new young massive star formation is happening. And now zooming in on the white rectangle in the middle, again with Spitzer, which is showing us um, bubbles from new young star formation, some from evolved stars. And it's also showing us more of this dark uh, dust, which just looks like blackness or blankness on this image, but it's actually not, it's the opposite of nothingness. It's where the gas is so dense and so cold um, that it's actually blocking the light behind it. And this is where we're most interested in seeing the formation of new stars in this cold, dense region. And so I love to look at this image and then now I'm gonna show you the next image, which uh, the green and the blue here is again, it's the warm dust that's showing you similar to what we had in the previous image, but now the red is looking at long, 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 long wavelengths where we're actually able to look through the dust and see all that cold, 
gas and dust that's actually emitting light at these long wavelengths. And so if I go back and forth between them, you can see all these dark shadows that look like the absence of stuff. And in the red now, you're seeing that's actually where all of this dense gas and dust is located. And so because we're interested in where stars are forming and how stars are forming in this galactic center, um, we are gonna really focus on these star forming regions. This central part of our galaxy, we call the Central Molecular Zone or CMZ. Um, and for context, the um, Sagittarius A star, supermassive black hole is just about in the middle of this image, a little bit to the right of center of this image is where the actual physical center of the galaxy is and the supermassive, you know, million solar mass black hole is right there at the center. And so this is the part of our galaxy that has this really chaotic behavior where it's breaking all these rules of star formation. This is our wild west of star formation. And this region has been the focus of my research for several years now. And I'm gonna tell you about two big surveys that we did. So the first one is a survey with the submillimeter array, which are these little antennas down in the valley there in the shadow, not the ones on the top of Mauna Kea, but this, these little radio dishes down in the valley. That's the submillimeter array. Um, and we did a large survey of this region and we called it CM Zoom because we were zooming in on the CMC. This is a video that shows the submillimeter array in action, the time-lapse, and you can see the Milky Way rising in the sky here at night and these telescopes looking at the center of the galaxy as the night goes on, just staring at it, occasionally going off to do calibration work. Um, and then going back and watching this. So the CM Zoom survey that I'm telling you about um, was conducted over the course of about 70 nights of observations. So just tons of blood, sweat, and tears from a lot of people to observe the center of the galaxy and try to understand how the rules, what the rules of star formation are in this region and how that might apply to the wider universe. Um, since that survey was completed, we're also doing a large follow-up survey with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array in Chile. This is like submillimeter array on steroids. It's more dishes, bigger, better, all the good things. Um, and it's not completely finished yet, though, our survey. So I'll tell you a little bit about it, but it's more like a stay tuned for the future. A uh, slide of humans, these surveys are done by humans. I just wanted to highlight a couple of them. In the top left image here is our CM Zoom team. And on the right here, you can see a large Zoom screenshot of one of our meetings for the uh, Atacama Large Millimeter Array CMZ Exploration Survey or ACES because that whole thing is a mouthful. And that's a large international group as well. Okay, so focusing on this first survey, let's focus in on one specific cloud. So these surveys are looking at the entire center of our galaxy, and we're gonna measure the star formation properties over this whole region. But in order to appreciate like, but like, what are you actually doing? What are we actually measuring? I wanted to show you this one little zoom in. This is a cloud that we call Bricklet D. Uh, which I could tell you more about later if you want. Um, and this is showing a Spitzer image in the background. And this little zoom in is also a Spitzer image. So in this image, we're seeing um, mostly just this dark outline of a cloud where we can't really see inside of the cloud. We're just seeing the shadow of the cloud. And so with this CM Zoom survey, now we are peering deep within this cloud. And so that's what you're seeing in the blue here is we're seeing the inside of the cloud and all of these little white peaks here. These are the, lo the locations where new stars are being formed as we speak. 
Um, so I'll just show you one more time, going from just this dusty image where you can't actually see the new stars that are being born because they're hidden by this dust. And now you can see deep inside the cloud to see the stars that are forming. Now we can start to ask questions like, how many stars are forming? How does it depend on other properties? Is there some kind of rule for star formation that we can write and write an equation and come back to it again over and over again? Um, so uh, this is this, the cloud in the center here is the one that uh, I just showed you. But now the, um, the survey data that we had is the one in red. And just again, highlighting that we're looking deep within these clouds. And so this just gives you a flavor of just a handful of the clouds that we looked at with the survey. I can show you my three favorite, which are highlighted um, in this white rectangle. These ones we call the three little pigs, to be honest, of course, because they just kind of looked like pigs at first. I actually came up with the name for these clouds when I was on Mauna Kea observing. It was the middle of the night. I was oxygen deprived. I can't believe it stuck. It's like, I feel like I had a million of these ideas and I was like, oh, but one of them was actually good the next morning when I thought about it. It was this one, the three little pigs. And what's fun about them is that um, there are these three clouds that seem really similar um, in previous data, but now that we are looking deep within the cloud, which is the white contours on top here. So it kind of just look like red blobs in the previous data. And now with these white contours, we can actually see that the one on the very left, we call the straw cloud, has very little substructure. There's almost no stars forming there. The middle one has a moderate amount of stuff going on. We call that one the sticks cloud. And the one on the right has a very substantial amount of stuff going on. Uh, lots of substructure, lots of density, lots of dense cores. And that one is our stone cloud. So that's those are some fun little clouds. Um, my former graduate student, H. Perry Hatchfield, who's now a postdoc at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, he did this really comprehensive catalog of all of the star forming regions in all of the center of the galaxy, uh, looked at a ton of correlations, basically finding that as you get higher density gas, you get more star formation, looks at the temperature, all of these different parameters. Um, and then you can also see, these are what some of the individual little cores of star formation look like. We're starting to get down to the resolution where you can almost see like the disk that's forming planets around them. Um, this one on the left, that's kind of this mostly blue, but with a couple of red highlights, you're actually seeing protostellar outflows from um, these new young forming stars, which is really incredible. And it's the first time we've ever seen protostellar outflows this far away in the center of our galaxy. <clears throat> The data from the ALMA telescope, the ACES survey, as I said, it's still quite preliminary, but I, I can start to show you some of what we're seeing, which is this really um, dynamic, interesting, filamented, highly filamentary structure that we're still trying to figure out what is going on here. This is showing a particular molecule that is mostly tracing dense gas. Um, and we're just seeing, again, deep within the cloud and seeing all this complicated turbulent and magnetic structure. Um, one of the cool things that we can do with this data is um, it has a spectral line axis and we can actually use the Doppler shift to go from frequency to velocity. So this is a data cube that's showing you, you know, two positions on the sky and then one coordinate of velocity. And that's what our third dimension is here. And so these are the kind of things that we're, we're studying in a lot of detail. So to bring this back to our earlier question about this rule for star formation. So this is this nice rule for star formation that we had in the solar neighborhood. So the area just around the sun, where if you look at the mass of a birth cloud above a specific density, it correlates really well with the number of young stars. Now, our galactic center is on a completely different scale. So let's now zoom this one way down. And then this is the scale we need to be at to see our galactic center. On this scale, this is where we expect the galactic center to be on this nice rule for star formation. 
It has a lot more mass at this really high density. And you, so you would expect to see a lot more young stars right here on this plot. But in reality, what we found is that the Milky Way Center is actually way below this relationship. And it's actually forming about one tenth of the number of stars that it should based on this relationship, uh, which is a really big problem because if you take this, you know, supposed law for star formation that we found and you try to apply it to one of these really distant galaxies in the early universe, um, you're going to be wrong. You're going to be really wrong. And people always joke that in astronomy, uncertainties are really high. Um, in astronomy, you're just like a factor of two, no big deal. But a factor of 10, a factor of 10 is really wrong. Um, so this rule for star formation does not work in the center of our galaxy. And this is a big problem because this is not just some cosmic oddity. It represents a large amount of the early universe. And so coming back to our simplified picture of uh, gravity as our pink My Little Pony and gas pressure as the blue one, what we think is going on is that uh, near our sun, there's a pretty good balance between the gravity and the gas pressure. And so you kind of get this pretty good relationship that every time you have a pink pony, you'll have another blue pony and they'll just hug and form a single star. And you get this nice balanced relationship. Whereas in our galactic center, you have a total overabundance of these blue horses, this gas pressure. The gas pressure is just so much higher that gravity, as hard as it works and as much as it does, it can't collapse all of these into stars. So that poor little one pink pony can only give one hug at a time. So instead of forming all the stars it wants to form, it can only form one of 10 that it normally would be able to form. And so uh, we're working now on writing down this equation and seeing what this actually looks like, but we think that we can correct for this. And so we think that the amount of star formation depends on the amount of dense gas. And we can also measure this gas pressure and use that to then predict how the stars are forming. So my group has started to work on some of these hydrodynamic simulations. So in this one, you're seeing the formation of a, of a galactic center. Um, on the bottom image is looking at um, an overall view of the galactic disk and gas feeding into the center of the galaxy. And the upper video here is showing um, the central region of the galaxy, similar to what we were just looking at in the previous figures. Um, and you can see this has happening over the course of, you know, right now the timestamp is 174 million years into the simulation. So over the course of many hundreds of millions of years. So the central region of the galaxy forms and forms stars. Some of it feeds into the black hole at the center. And I think just by watching this video, you can start to appreciate that this is a little bit more complicated than that earlier simulation where we watched, where it just kind of slowly collapses under the force of gravity and forms stars. In this case, you don't just have gravity, but you have this orbital motion. So the gas is orbiting extremely quickly around the galactic center. I can show that again. It's orbiting extremely quickly around the galactic center it's sloshing around and you constantly have new material feeding into the center of the galaxy. So all of this is driving that gas pressure to be higher and higher and higher, which means that the gas is not able to form stars quite as efficiently. Now, in part of our quest to understand how these stars are formed, we wanna understand what the overall structure of this region is and test these simulations. So this is a cartoon of what we think this inner region of the galaxy might look like. And of course, like I said before, we're stuck in the disk of a spiral galaxy. And so we're always just looking through all of this material into the center of the galaxy. <clears throat> and so we're not able to see what it looks like from the top down. So we try to compare with models. This is one model of what we think it might look like from the top down where this orange ellipse is kind of the region that's shown in that picture that we've seen before. Now I'm gonna compare this with 
a real galaxy. So this is now a Hubble image of a nearby galaxy, NGC 4303, where you kind of have these dark dust lanes. That's actually where the gas is feeding into the center of the galaxy. And then that inner bright region, that's the galactic nucleus that's forming new, um, new stars. That's where the black hole is. That's where the gas is feeding. That's the, the galactic center. Um, and so this is sort of our model of what this might look like. And here's an example of a real galaxy that has a very similar shape and structure. And of course, we can look at many, many nearby galaxies and see what their shape and structure is and try to make a best guess about what ours is. And so from this, we've developed a couple of models. So shown here are, again, two cartoons that are trying to match the color scheme of our edge-on view of the center of the galaxy on the left with the top-down view on the right. And you can see that there are some similarities and some differences. And so we're working to try to uncover which of these models is correct. Uh, so far, the one on the bottom seems to be seems to be the best model. Um, and by doing this, we can test these simulations and see how much gas is actually flowing in and um, try to understand this role for star formation. So once we are able to figure out exactly what the role of this gas pressure is and how this changes this role for star formation. We hope to have this new improved law for star formation that connects us from our nearby star forming regions like the Orion Nebula, all the way out to these nearby galaxies, the Whirlpool Galaxy and the Pinwheel Galaxy, and even further out to these very distant galaxies in the early universe and have a law for star formation that connects all of these together and allows us to make predictions about these extremely distant galaxies and how star formation proceeded in this environment that is very different than the one in our own solar neighborhood. So um, connecting the ladies from Downton Abbey with the Wild West shootout mode on Grand Theft Auto uh, is really what's necessary in order to understand how the star formation process has happened throughout the cosmos. And one interesting thing that I'd like to finish with as well is that I was talking about star formation in like the neighborhood of our sun. Like it's this really calm and well-behaved process like these nice ladies having tea from Downton Abbey. Um, but actually our sun is about four and a half billion years old. And so when our sun was forming, it was not Down Abbey tea time. It was more like Wild West shootout time. This is was like 5 billion years ago in the universe's history. So about a third of the history of the universe when the gas was more turbulent and the gas pressure was higher. And you had um, this more complex star formation that was happening. So the laws that we're learning about our galactic center, we think actually should apply to how our own sun, the origin of um, our days and our nights formed. So thank you for taking this tour of the wild west of star formation with me. And I'd be delighted to take questions. Thank you very much, Cara, for a wonderful presentation and telling us about uh, this star formation and the uh, behaved and non-behaved. Uh, so uh, while people are typing in their questions and then we also go to the in-person audience, let me begin with this. Um, by looking at the current state of a star, not knowing where it is, uh, would be able to tell uh, about how it formed. Was it a form in a well-behaved manner or not? That's a great question. Um, I don't know. I don't, there are some clues, like how much metal content, how heavily enriched the star is that can tell us a little bit about its birth environment. But outside of that, stars seem to be stubbornly, like just once they form, like all of that is kind of erased from it. And that's kind of an interesting thing. And another thing is that like the mass of a star 
you think that how big the star itself is should really depend on what the environment is, but it very stubbornly just seems to be the same no matter where we look in the universe. And so stars just, once they turn on and have this nuclear fusion, it seems like they just, they're newly born and they just forget where they came from as far as we can tell. Great question. Okay, and uh, another question is that uh, about the moment of the birth, uh, we talk about how this, uh, the hug uh, uh, analogy that you used, and uh, I, I guess the moment of the birth is that the hug, the squeeze is so hard and the, so that this thing starts fusing uh, um, yeah. uh, hydrogen. Uh, is mm -hmm. that... Does that happen in a moment or is that a uh, uh, long period as well? Um, yeah, great question. Um, and I think I think it's in from in astronomical terms, I think it's pretty quick. It's kind of but astronomical terms are like, you know, a few thousand years maybe is the amount of time that it takes. And so really what happens is that um, as it starts to get denser and denser and denser and hot, the temperatures are hotter, the gas starts to move faster and faster and faster. And that's when you have these chance collisions between these nuclei. And so you probably start with like, if you have popcorn in the microwave, you'll hear just one pop and then another pop and then another pop. And then suddenly it starts to explode and then the popping just continues and then multiply that by about 10 billion years for a star like a sun, and then the popping will slow down. But I think it's it's relatively instantaneous on in astronomical terms, but probably of order at least a thousand years, I would say. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rezo? So, yes. Rezo, is, uh, uh, we're on the wrong week of the month uh, because of the meeting date, and another group needs to use the hall at nine o'clock, which is coming up really quickly. Can we take a couple of questions from the hall, then turn it over to you, and then we'll pack up the the digital session from our end of it, and you guys can can, can go ahead and continue. Sure, please go ahead. Okay, uh, probably two questions. Good, no questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks wait, for wait, coming, wait, though, wait, everybody. <laughs> wait, 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 wait a minute. We have one. We question. have a question. Okay. Okay. Go great. Ahead. Okay, he said, how does the supernova process in the galaxies affect star production? Is that correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, John knows the answer down here in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead, Riza. Yeah, Cara, please. Yeah, um, that's a wonderful question. And so um, we are still learning all about that. We know that when stars die, they give off a lot of energy. And especially with something like a supernova explosion, it is a massive amount of energy, like the biggest explosions in the universe that we know of. Um, and we know that this affects the galaxy in which they live. It probably destroys some star formation that's starting nearby it, but it could also trigger star formation in other parts of a galaxy. And this is like this complex interplay that we usually call galaxy evolution. So how a galaxy goes from being not a galaxy to being like the kind of galaxies that we see. Um, and it's an active area of research. And so we know that they're related. We know that it's important. It can start star formation. It can stop star formation. Um, and that's kind of all we can say now. Totally an active area of research and a really excellent question. Okay, one more question. Talking about the center of the Milky Way galaxy being chaotic. More pressure. Star formation is lower. Okay. You is expected eventually gravity will chip away at the process. Okay. Will it change or always be the same in the center of the Milky Way? Is that your question? Oh, would gravity take away take 
would get gravity take control? I think that's the question. Yeah, great question. Um, so gravity would take over. And actually one of the predominant theories of what's happening in the center of our galaxy is that it goes through these cycles where you have a lot of gas inflowing into the center of the galaxy and it just builds up and builds up and builds up until it's so much that it just overcomes. This so gravity can just take over, form a bunch of stars, and then all of the supernova explosions and energy from those new stars blow out all the rest of the gas and dust. And then it starts over again. More gas inflows, comes into the center of the galaxy, not enough to form stars, more and more and more. And then gravity takes over and you have this big burst of star formation again. And so gravity should always win eventually, um, but it's just a matter of how long or just the balance between what's happening with the gas pressure. But yeah, gravity okay. is a very powerful force. So, mm -hmm. Okay, John Hoot has another question. Um, are, you, are you looking at uh, the effect of, the, of modulating the rate of inflow? Because that's going to change the way the turbulence, and that's going to create eddies of low pressure, which can mm -hmm. then be your, your eggs to, to make those stars. Yeah. Really insightful and totally, totally right. Yes. So my graduate student, um, H. Perry Hatchfield, whose picture I showed earlier, he studied this as like a key part of his thesis. And so he studied what this rate of inflow is and how this rate of inflow changes. So in the simulations, we can see how this changes over millions of years time scale. Um, in the real data, we can only really see what's happening right now, but he was studying what happens in the simulations. And you're exactly right that the rate of inflow is gonna have a, have a huge factor in how this process goes. And it seems to be correlated with then the star formation that you see there. Okay, uh, we we as a club and members have had some connection with the uh, Owens Valley Radio Observatory. And uh, we're part of, we got to view the Karma Array when it was active after it changed. Awesome. Yeah, mm -hmm. so we've got some experience with that. What frequency was the the Mauna Kea um, sub-millimeter observations at 80 gigahertz? Uh, 230 gigahertz. Okay, that's up there. Yep. Well, that's <laughs> okay, that's all from uh, on ground in uh, in uh, Chapman University. We'll turn it over to you guys. Okay, thanks so much for spending your Friday evening with me. Well, thank you so much. It's nice to be on the, on the bleeding edge of what's going on in, in uh, astronomy. Clap. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> we, we still have some questions online, uh, if you can. Uh, of course. Yeah. Thank you for the crew uh, on the ground. So the next question is, does the fact that the Milky Way is supposedly a barred spiral galaxy, uh, rather than just a simple spiral galaxy, have an effect on a star formation at center? Wow. These are, I mean, I feel like I'm giving a professional astronomy colloquium at Princeton University. These are phenomenal questions. Yes, it does. The bar is thought to be responsible for driving that gas inwards. And so in spiral galaxies that don't have a bar, um, we don't see the same kind of conundrum because you don't have that constant inflow of turbulence and energy. And so this bar seems to be responsible for driving this gas inwards. And so it really is because we have this bar. So great question. Thank you. And uh, we know uh, to some extent how much material is available in the uh, region determines what type of star we get. Uh, is there any direct correlation with the density of gas available and the type of the star that's formed? Yeah, another awesome question. Um, this is this is sort of one of the things that I was alluding to earlier, is that um, astronomers spend a lot of time thinking about how different masses of stars are formed. And that's because the mass of a star, whether it's a star like our sun, or 10 times or 100 times the mass, or even lower mass, it changes everything about how that star lives its life and how it dies. Does it die as a black hole? A supernova, a white dwarf, um, all of this 
depends exactly on the mass. And so we want to know, well, what determines the mass of that star, or like you said, the density of that star, because those things would be interchangeable. And as far as we can tell, um, this is set by some um, function we call the initial mass function. And it seems to apply in the center of the galaxy, in distant galaxies, in the disk of the galaxy. And it seems to not really matter where the star formed or what the environment was like, which is kind of frustrating because it it feels like it should matter from a physics perspective, but it probably just means we don't fully understand yeah, the physics of how that said, happens. Said, on, 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 oh, not informed correctly, that, that they aren't going to take over till 10, but they want to get in here and set up. Yeah. So if, and, and nine o'clock is usually when we should end. But we got we got a live fish this time, and right? she's really good. oh okay. Sorry for yeah. the interruption. Looks like they didn't know they're on air. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, please uh, continue. Uh, I think I think that was all I just wanted to say. I think that was a great question, and it seems like that imprint is is lost, and so um, it doesn't seem like it depends on the environment. Although I feel like it should, and lots of people feel like it should. So I think that's another unsolved mystery. Is is there a way that it depends on the environment? And if so, and if not, why not? Because it seems like it should. Thank you very much. And then uh, this other question says, you did mention the effect of the gas pressure on star formation and how it uh, it's hogged by the gravity. Uh, now, can you tell us a little bit more about the other factors like the magnetic field uh, strengths or maybe conservation of angular momentum? What do What role do those things play? Yeah, I, I feel like, like I said, you guys should all just accompany me to one of these astronomy conferences because these are all of the topics that we spend all our time figuring out and we, we don't really have answers to. Magnetic fields are probably the most difficult because they are so <clears throat> difficult to measure. You can't see them directly. You have to measure their effect. And especially when gas is moving around really chaotically, um, it's really hard to see the effect of magnetic fields. And so we have a couple of different techniques to do it. But I would say we're really in our infancy in terms of understanding the magnetic fields. So one of the things that the magnetic fields can do is that um, in space, most particles, it's not unusual for them to have a little bit of charge because you have these heavier elements, you have you know electrons getting stripped away all the time, it's no big deal. But that means that these charged particles are, they have an electric charge. And so they are dictated in large part by the magnetic fields. And so if you have magnetic fields that are going in one direction through a cloud, that means that those charged particles, they can't move across those magnetic fields because once they get close to the magnetic field, they're going to want to rotate around the magnetic field. They can move up and down the magnetic field, but they don't want to go across the magnetic field. And so that means if you're trying to form a star there, those particles, they can't cross that magnetic field lines. And so it's really hard for them to form in certain directions, but they can move and form in other directions. And so a lot of times this has the effect of actually making it harder to form the stars just because it's, it's harder for the gas to come together under the force of gravity and to collapse. Um, and the question about angular momentum is a good one as well. Um, I kind of think of that more as like the the overall turbulent sort of chaotic motions of the gas, um, which generally, like I said, impede the star formation process. But you could imagine, um, you know, compression waves that happen from this as well that could actually enhance the star formation in particular locations. Okay, thank you very much. Um, now, uh, you did actually, uh, mentioned this, but the questioner wants a little bit more elaboration on how mm -hmm. important of a role the black hole uh, at the center of the galaxy plays uh, in this uh, wild west. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so if you just look at it from a purely gravitational standpoint, the supermassive black hole, this giant monster about a million solar masses, it really only affects the things that are just outside of it. 
about a few light years around it is where like it actually has a gravitational effect on the stars and the gas and the dust. So the rest of the stuff around it, that entire central molecular zone, that doesn't even feel the gravity of the black hole because there's so much other stuff going on there that it's just a minuscule factor. Um, that being said, our supermassive black hole is really quiet right now. It's not eating a bunch of material and spewing other material out. But if it were, that is gonna have a gigantic effect on the gas and the star formation. And that's because when the black holes um, eat things, they usually don't eat all of it. They usually, some of it goes in and then due to conservation of angular momentum of it, some of it um, gets accelerated and ejected along the poles or in different directions as like energetic radiation. And then you form like a disk around it as well, which has again, energetic radiation. So just to clarify, sorry if I'm not being clear, it's almost midnight here. So I actually it's after midnight. So I'm <laughs> sorry if I'm losing some clarity. Let me back up for a second. So a black hole is a region of space time where not even light can escape. That's what defines the black hole itself is that once anything goes inside, nothing can come out. But when we're talking about like radiation from a black hole, what I'm really talking about is like a disk of material outside of the black hole that's being accelerated by the immense gravity of the black hole. And so particles are moving really fast and you get um, this intense radiation and winds and jets that can all form. And again, this is because of the black hole, but it's outside of the black hole. Because again, when something goes into the black hole, it never, except for Hawking radiation, it pretty much never comes out. So we're just talking about the stuff outside of the black hole that's driven by the black hole. Um, and so our galactic center black hole is really quiet right now. It's not really eating any gas or stars. And so it's also not spewing out tons of radiation. Um, but we know that it has in the past and it probably will again in the future, in which case you could have all these stars happily forming and then suddenly they get blasted with gamma rays and huge winds and all of it just gets blown apart. And that probably has happened over the history of our galaxy many times and will happen again. So um, on a longer time scale, it's definitely important at the present moment most of the gas and dust probably doesn't even know the black hole is there. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, the other question concerns uh, uh, dark matter. Uh, the questioner says galaxy centers have a high concentration of dark matter. What assumptions are made about the distribution of dark matter in star formation models? Yeah, great question. Um, so in our models, we actually, we don't even include dark matter in the hydrodynamical simulations. And that's because, um, so dark matter is the dominant form of matter in the universe, as far as we, I mean, we obviously don't understand everything about it since we're still calling it dark matter, which just means, I don't know what it is, but it's dark. Um, that material, um, dominates the matter of the universe, but it's not evenly distributed. So the thing that makes dark matter so puzzling is that most of the matter that we know, it interacts with other matter. It can crash into that matter. It can emit light. It can absorb light. It goes through all these physical processes that make life really interesting for normal matter. It can collapse into a disk of a galaxy and stars and planets and do all of that. Dark matter doesn't collide with anything. It doesn't reflect light. It doesn't emit light. It doesn't block light. And so all of the physical processes that make our galaxy a nice flat spiral galaxy don't affect dark matter. And so when you're forming a star, um, this is all driven by like, you know, gas collides and starts to fall into the center of the, you know, star forming region, dark matter doesn't do that. It just follows the overall gravitational potential. And so um, 
the dark matter of our galaxy is actually this giant spherical halo, like giant, giant spherical halo that surrounds our entire galaxy. And if you just think about, um, you know, like this thing, imagine just being like in a planetarium and like that is all the dark matter of the galaxy. And in the center, you just have like a little Frisbee in the center. And that's the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And so that's where all of the stuff that makes people and stars is. And then all the dark matter is distributed amongst that much larger volume. And so because that really large volume, um, even though there's so much more dark matter than regular matter, it's all distributed over that large volume. So when you're looking at that tiny little disk in the center, the contribution of dark matter is minuscule. It has no effect on the things that are happening within, inside of the galaxy on small scales. And so our simulations don't include dark matter. If they did, it wouldn't change the numbers because it's such a minuscule contribution on those scales, which I know is kind of counterintuitive to the idea that it dominates. But if you're doing like entire galaxy simulations, you need to include it or like clusters of galaxies or universe simulations, those will not work without dark matter. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, in the calm, well-behaved solar neighborhood, small red dwarf stars seem to be the majority. Are there clues coming from simulations about formation of very large stars or an upper limit on star mass? Mm -hmm. I would like to know the answer to that question too, actually. I feel like I I used to be more in tune with exactly what's going on with massive stars. I think the last I heard was, you know, about 120 times the mass of our sun was kind of the record holder. But that was a while ago, so it might be updated since then. It may be larger than that. Or sometimes what happens is that these really massive stars, you observe it more carefully and you find it's actually two stars. So you divide the mass by two, but last I heard it was about 120 solar masses, but it could be larger than that by now. And I just, I don't know, but that's a really great question. Okay, thank you. And uh, we're almost at the end. There is uh, just a few more questions. Um, the next questioner wants to know, what do you make of the mature looking, fully formed galaxies at the edge of space as seen by recent images from the James Webb Space Telescope? Yeah, this is puzzling. I, I guess I would say still an active area of research and people like to make exciting claims. Um, you know, you see something exciting and you just want to like yell and scream and tell the whole world all about it. Um, you know, some of these things that seem mysterious um, end up to have been you know, a mistake, like somebody mistook how far away the galaxy actually was and not intentionally, not through any kind of deceit, but just because these observations are challenging and they usually have a lot of assumptions that go into it. And so there's always something that can go wrong with that. Um, but I mean, other times, I mean, James Webb does seem to be kind of rewriting our understanding of the cosmos and like I said, when you build these big, fancy new space telescopes, you always have this really careful list of exactly what you're going to do with it and exactly what you're going to find. But all, all, the most fun is the stuff that you didn't expect. And, and, you know, I feel like we're just kind of dipping our toes in the water with that with James Webb. And, you know, I can't really comment in any sort of meaningful way on that particular question that you asked, except, except to say, I'm also intrigued and I will watch with interest, but I don't have anything more to say about it at this time. Okay, thank you very much. And the last question is, uh, is a star formation an example of something that defies the second law of thermodynamics? Oh, very interesting. That's really insightful. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it is, right? And so is the formation of planets and people and life and so um people sometimes think about this as you know maybe if you're decreasing entropy in one particular part of the universe maybe it's increasing somewhere else or maybe you could think of entropy in a more nuanced way like some of the the disorder that 
humans can cause to our world and our planet and the, the world around us and the endless possibilities that come from that. It's a really deep kind of insightful question um, that I don't think we have like a satisfying answer to. I think it's really insightful. Okay, Cara, that was it for the question. Again, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, we learned a lot and uh, we hope to have be able to have you back in the future when the research uh, progresses more. Um, okay. So before I end the session, do you have any final remarks to make? Uh, no, I just like to say again, thank you so much for spending your Friday evening with me. I am a whole continent away, but um, I really appreciate all of these wonderful questions and your attention. And I obviously love what I do. And so sharing it with you has really been an honor. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you very much for uh, staying uh, this late in tonight with us. So I would like to also thank all the attendees for staying with us and asking their questions. Um, let me remind you that you could check all the upcoming events at our website, ocastronomers.org, at the calendar section. Um, and uh, I wish you all great uh, rest of the night and I hope to see you all back at next month. Bye-bye, everybody now.